Welcome to P is for Policing on the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Today, we are honoured to have David Castles, President of the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform. After dedicating three decades to the Edmonton Police Force, David assumed the role of Chief of Police in Winnipeg. He brought his extensive expertise to bear on numerous governmental and community boards at the level local, provincial, and national levels, including a notable stint as, on the advisory board of the Law Commission of Canada. During his tenure as Winnipeg's police chief, David spearheaded a comprehensive departmental reorganization championing the implementation of decentralized community policing model. Over the past 22 years, David has lent his consultancy services to various governmental departments and co-founded the Coalition of Canadian Police Reform. So, David, welcome to the Political Trenches. Thank you, uh, Chris. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to start off a line of questioning here, and it's always weird to start a line of questioning to a former police chief, but I'm so happy I get to do that. <laughs> So, David, can you give us a quick overview of the mission of the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform? Of course. Uh, the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform was um, formed by a group of concerned citizens who were essentially tried to elevate the police profession in Canada. This training in Canada is very short, and very subjective, and it's completely inconsistent from one department to another or one province to another. Our hope, uh, our vision is to see the creation of national training and education standards guided by a college of professional policing. Uh, the current curriculum today is, uh, as I said, too short. Most are 24 weeks across Canada. Uh, they are very uh, vary in length from Quebec at 15 weeks to the RCMP, for example, 27 weeks, uh, some as, as long as 28 weeks in British Columbia. Even then, the curriculum itself is not evidence-based. Uh, it's usually locally based. Uh, some, some is very old, outdated, uh, sort of paramilitary model. And we believe like doctors, or, um, nurses, and lawyers, and even technicians, accountants, that we need to elevate the profession. For example, six months to become a police officer in Canada, 48 months to become a nurse. And the police play a very, very important role in society. We believe that the profession needs to be elevated in this. See the creation of a college of people. So I, I want to start with sort of encompassing what you've just said there. And I want to know, you talk about how the disparity between BC and Quebec with the reforms, but I'm going to play devil's advocate with you here for a second, because I think uh, you're, you're, you'd be used to this question. The issues that people face in BC are different than the issues that are faced in Quebec or even Ontario, even in the Atlantic provinces. Why is it important to have a cohesive training uh, reform that ensures that the policing that you're getting in BC is the same that you're getting in Quebec or in Ontario or even here in Alberta? Or is there a, a, a particular need for that? Well, the disparity, um, of course, uh, the consistency, I should say, is so important. What's missing is the relevant subject matter from the curriculum. You know, there's uh, there's so many things uh, like uh, understanding racism um, and your own uh, how you deal with it, uh, intelli emotional intelligence skills and how you deal with mental mental illness or uh, the diverse population that we deal with. Uh, the I, I'm understanding the residential schools and the indigenous issues in Canada. Surprisingly, none of that is taught in most entry level training. The focus is all paramilitary. It's on marching and uh, use of force and uh, command and control in, in, in our complex and diverse 21st century. And there are many subjects. Now, when I talk about how important consistency is, by comparing our role with that of a, an accountant, you know, accountant in Nova Scotia, an accountant in Hills, Alberta, you're like get the very same service because of the professional consistency they have in their function. The same with doctors or lawyers or nurses. You're not likely to get the same 
a service from a police officer uh, in Nova Scotia, as you do Calgary or Edmonton or from the RCMP. Because each are trained differently. And again, we believe it's too short, far too subjective. There are no evidence, very few evidence based programs in training. It is all very traditional. And what I described is ugly. I'd like to jump in here if I can just a little bit too. So you've obviously had a look or you and your colleagues have seen how policing operates across the country, um, whether it's a, a national service like the RCMP or a local one or a provincial one too, for that matter. You've, all, you've probably had a look beyond that as well. Are there, is there a place you would think does it best that you think would where you could we ought to be emulating or bits and pieces coming from various, various places? David, the Seem to make well, sense. There, are very, there are very good training programs and, and police education programs in Canada. Please don't misunderstand them. But it's the inconsistency that is so important to bring, to elevate the profession, to, to function to a true profession. But an example that I would give you that there are two uh, that are very important that we would like to model. We'd like to see a model in Canada. We'd like to see the federal government create the legislation to create the college, and the college would do the research. But the UK College of Policing is one example. There are other uh, colleges of policing in other democracies that are just starting. The Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada is a model that we would like to do. That is a model where all doctors across Canada must achieve certain standards. And the, uh, the medical institutions all across Canada teach the same curriculum. So therefore, you know when you're getting here in a general practitioner or a specialist in medicine across the country, you're going to get a very high level of professional service. Now, it is not the same. When you, when you deal with a police officer in Nova Scotia, or, and I'm just using examples uh, in Calgary or even Edmonton, you may not be dealing with a police officer that has a understanding of racism and the impact of racism. How to deal with their own personal bias, understands emotional intelligence skills, understand the effect of the residential schools and the 60s school and many other things on indigenous people. Immigrants, for example, there are many immigrants, as you know, are afraid of the police. They don't understand the role of the police in the world. But the police that themselves that are trained, yes, they can march very well, and yes, they can shoot the firearm straight, and they can do all of the things that are very traditional. But the important things when it comes to dealing with people in our complex 21st century is missing. We believe those are the, and those are only a very few of the components that we believe are important. Must be included in a standardized professional education program for police officers across Canada. And there are many people who agree. And if I can go on just a little bit, there are many studies: the police sector council studies, the economics of police studies, many other commission reports, uh, public inquiries after death that have recommended national training standards. Like the Royal College of Physicians and Research to provide the best uh, training and education for our police officers. Uh, it is very, very difficult for a young police officer without some of the uh, empathy, emotional intelligence skills, and personal skills, and all of the other uh, And again, Ian, there are many more that are, that are absent. Uh, they, we send them out on the street with this basic paramilitary training and expect them to solve some of Canada's uh, complex social problems, whether it's mental illness and, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, and that's why we believe that in cases uh, conflict occurs between police officers in Canada. And, uh, and I said, uh, quite honestly, we may be setting them up for failure because we're not giving them the skills to money uh, and the skills that they need to do the job effectively. You've, you've, you've got many decades in policing, of course, and you must have seen some fairly significant changes. You've talked about uh, where you think things are right now in terms of society and the need for policing to react to some of those changes that society has gone through. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen through the, the service of uh, public safety or policing over the time you've been involved? Well, it's, it's always, I think a lot of it is even very relevant today and very obviously. Look at the uh, conflict between race and police. Look at the Ontario 
and the movements are causing conflict across Canada now, the political discourse uh, between uh, those who have different political views and spilling out in Calgary and Edmonton and Toronto and Ottawa. Uh, the police have no knowledge of any of that. Part of an understanding of the curriculum. Uh, the issue of mental illness. Uh, for, for some reason, I've recognized over nine years at least, the care of people with mental issues has, um, has been sort of dumped on society. The, I know so, I know affected schools and hospitals and so, so the police are now faced with a complex drug issue, uh, the violence involving firearms, uh, particularly the conflict uh, and this seems to be where the police have the most difficult and the, the, the place mount uh, when police officers are dealing with people, either indigenous people or different racial or demographics in their background. That's where a lot of conflict comes in, and we're not preparing our police off to deal with the many of these issues, or at least have the emotional intelligence skills and the knowledge to deal with them so that they don't find themselves. In. There have been many studies, Chris and uh, Ian, that are very important. Uh, that is that they find, uh, they found both in the United States and Britain, that people have a higher education, broader education, broader knowledge of issues, not get themselves involved in conflict as well. Uh, those that do not have that broad education background, or at least a broader education. Our belief is that in order to have an effective college of policing, we need to identify what are the real competency required of today's police officers in our 21st century, and then build an education program around that. And that begins to elevate the profession, like you do with nurses and lawyers and accountants. And you have a rapid and accepted evidence-based set of standards. None of that exists in police. Very dis disappointing. But I also want to add, because I think this is a majority of our police officers are very dedicated. They're very committed. They know uh, full well what they want to achieve uh, when they go out to help. But it's not there. It's, it's, that, that is not the issue. The issue is the government today. Uh, whether it's their own police organization, their own municipality, province, or the federal government, are not giving them the skills and the tools that they need to do the job. So I am a I'm a, a proud police officer after many years, and you know, I work the streets for a significant amount of time. And I know what it's like out there. It's a very proud job today, and they're very committed people. We're not giving them the broad range of knowledge and education, training, and skills they need to do it effectively. So I, I'm going to pick up on that last statement here, Dave, if, if you don't mind. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot more municipalities move to a municipal police force. We're seeing uh, the province of Alberta talk about a provincial police force. We're seeing the RCMP having their struggles with recruitment and retention around even police officers in more rural and remote communities. You, you talk about the training aspect of it and getting people into this. Why is it that there is the inconsistency? Because the police force is there no matter where we are. In all parts of this country, we're, we're under the umbrella of a police force, whether it be municipal, provincial, or even federal. But the inconsistency you're talking about seems to be disparaging that the training isn't happening. Why isn't it happening right now where people are getting together all three levels of government and saying, okay, we need to make a cohesive message and move forward. Why don't the government levels of government want to talk? Yeah, I think the question is two part, Chris, and I think uh, if I can answer it for you. Um, the British Columbia government is even thinking of a provincial police service. The Alberta government is thinking of the provincial police service. Grand Prairie, uh, Surrey are moving from the RCMP to a municipal. I think that's one issue. And that issue, I think, in my opinion, centers around having to have a really decentralized local. Uh, the RCMP, while they're very, very committed, have a long history in Canada, uh, they are essentially managed and guided uh, by Ottawa. Uh, everything that uh, is in their policies and procedures is off in Ottawa. Uh, as the local uh, assistant commissioner in Alberta has said, it's difficult for the RCMP uh, to move quickly and to change things from a local level. They're not as nimble as a local police service. 
So a truly decentralized credit facing model has to be managed and run by a local community. The whole uh, about community policing is to be able to have an open communication with local government and make shifts in priorities, uh, whether they're operational priorities or financial priorities or reducing the number of police officers or in them is made locally. That, that just doesn't function when you're run by a large organization on a model. It's like trying to turn a massive ship around in a hurry when it's very, very difficult. Um, the other issue is around training. Uh, the governments themselves have recognized in the police sector such inconsistency that it needs to be standards in training and education. If you have the complex uh, notion now that you, know, you have uh, both a federal, that is a, a, a federal government responsibility and a provincial responsibility. So, so our our vision, of course, is to, and we've had, uh, if I could just step, take step out of your question, we've had a, a constitutional and legal analysis that tells us that the federal government has four or five lawful and uh, proper ways under the Constitution to the qualities of policing. Uh, and uh, we hope that it's created. Provinces themselves would want to buy into it because they'd see the benefit of the national standards. And they could uh, they could administer a, a national certification program. And then, of course, the RCMP nationally could be part of this, this approach. So part of it, I think, well, a lot of it is political. Government decides if they'd like to replace the RCMP with uh, a local police team. And it's also provincial governments and the federal government that would have to be supportive partners in a policy policing to ensure that uh, the training and education of the police is effective. Uh, and it's a model that works very well. The model that works very well with doctors, who the Royal College of Physicians and Engineers. They all have agreed. Establish the quality's national standards and license or certify or approve individual accountants or whatever it is under under that protocol. We believe the same model is very effective. Police officers, Chris, have a very important role. You have power of arrest, search, seizure, the use of deadly force, dealing with people in a very complex, fast moving change of society, and their training and education is simply that's what's important to us. Oh, I want to go for that. Oh, I just have one last question because yeah, it, it follows up on this, and then I'll let you go, Ian. The great thing about having two co-hosts is you always interrupt each <laughs> other. Um, what's the short-term solution then? Because right now you're talking about you need the provinces and the federal government to come together to make a cohesive message to say we need a school that will train our police officers for a cohesive message across the country but let's be honest here dave for two yes. seconds the federal and provincial governments are not going to do that tomorrow they're not going to do that next week possibly not even by the end of this year what in the short term does your organization do to ensure that the reforms need to that need to start happening now do while you're trying okay. to play catch up with the federal and provincial government yes I've been asked a couple of times uh, about that, and I would be very honest to say there is no short term. The reality is today is that police police organizations, including the RCMP, are having a difficult time recruiting people. Part of the reason they're having a difficult time recruiting people is a general and ongoing lack of trust, a declining lack of trust in police officers in Canada, which is very disappointing considering that they're all very committed people. But there is a declining trust, and part of the declining trust is the police officers who are always with their very short term subjective training don't have the skills that they need to do the job. So there is no short term solution. The only advice, the only advice I could say as a, as a former chief or somebody who's been involved in this 40 years now is much of the traditional training we give our police officers can even change today. Locally, uh, Edmonton, Calgary, uh, Toronto, the Ontario Police College, all of the police colleges could be able to reduce the number of traditional subjects. Okay? The, 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 the excessive hours we spent on marching and uh, use of force and uh, command and control instruction, 
the legislation they can reduce some of those hours and increase it with subjects that are current and relevant. The most important part is understanding emotional intelligence skills, understanding your own ability and empathy when dealing with people, taking more time to think things through before overreacting uh, with some uh, physical skill that was taught in your use of force training. So there's a, a big short term solution. I believe that the recruiting problem in Canada will continue until uh, public trust in the police begins to turn around and uh, increase again. At one time, public trust in the police in Canada was as high as it was for doctors and teachers to, uh, and other professions. It's incredibly it's, uh, deteriorating rather quick. Our term solution is expand your six month training to an eight month training program. Put more relevant subject matter. Do some of the um, uh, the very outdated traditional subject matter. I was talking to a chief in Ottawa not long ago who said that he just had a tour and a briefing in the Ontario Police College to find out that he learned a lot of what they're talking about 40 years ago. And he said, quite honestly, Dave, very little has changed between when he went through the training and now. Now, if other professions, accountants and doctors and lawyers and engineers and and even tradespeople uh, did not advance um, like uh, like policing. You know, uh, we would uh, have a lot less confidence in uh, our accounts and our lawyers if we didn't progress like they are. And this is not difficult for the provinces to join board. It's, it's not, it, understand and be a part of. It. Uh, it's very expensive uh, when you have complaints against police officers. A lot of the things go wrong with that. All of the appeals and the, the boards that have to sit and decide and the lawsuits that go out of inappropriate conduct by the police. Uh, this in the long term of actually saving this college is a tremendous amount of money and all about those other problems. Uh, the complaints against police officers would drop. The service would increase, improve considerably. Uh, but the training program, without that, training and education and those components must be brought or we are uh, placing uh, service delivery, in my opinion, will continue to deteriorate. And that is not to say that our police officers that are out there are not dedicated and to the work. They're simply not giving them all the skills, knowledge, and tools. So you our talked good about cop, gad uh, cap. Our good cop, bad cop routine can continue here, Ian. Go off to go for it. <laughs> well, you're wearing the white shirt. I'm not wearing black, but whatever. The, uh, Dave, you've met, you've talked about governments, provincial, federal, municipal. You've talked about some citizens as well. A lot, if uh, you probably know this, most, most police services in Canada are probably unionized. What's the response, if any, from police unions about standardization of training or increasing? The, the requirements or quality of training that's required? You know, that's a very good question. I mean, Ian, a lot of people would be surprised. Uh, the Canadian Police Association themselves, Tom, Tom Stanitak is the president, has called for uh, better, more, more training in education and an entity like the college several years ago. And even police sector council study said the same thing, the economics of police. Uh, uh, we have members uh, on our coalition that are former and serving police officers Oh, well, that this needs to change, and they're very supportive of it. Now, you will still get certain segments of uh, the police associations who are essentially union representatives that, that have a different vision. Maybe use of force and uh, other components are important to them, and maybe they've heard something bad about a particular uh, colleague somewhere else, and, and they may uh, be naysayers, and they may not be supportive. The reality is that the Canadian Police Association. Uh, my last conversation with them, they fully support what we do. The Canadian Association of Police Governments fully support us. The, the Canadian Association of Chief Police is on site. While they haven't formally supported us, they're still on site and they have their own um, uh, committees that uh, recommend uh, national training standards on things like the use of force itself. And even the use of force training in Canada is inconsistent. De escalation, this surprises people. Even de-escalation training, when you de-escalate a very emotional situation before you apply the use of force, is inconsistent in some provinces and departments and non-existent. It's not even taught de-escalation, which people just find it shocking. But that just goes to show the inconsistency in the type of training that this has to be getting in our country. And I'm proud of the, um, of the function of 
interesting, and I want to see uh, this. I want to see it elevated over time. And we know that it won't happen overnight. We know that we're into it for the long term. But it's like anything else. If it's important, we will consist. We have hundreds of members. We have a very strong board of directors. We have uh, sort of behind the doors political support, and we must wait for the right opportunity to move forward. We had hoped that the Mass Casual Commission and their recommendations. In fact, they did support our recommendations. We talked about a college for the RCMP, get away from the boot camp uh, training that they're going through in uh, Regina right now, and broaden their knowledge and education. And the Mass Casualty Commission uh, made that recommendation. We would have hoped that was a catalyst. That the public safety minister at the time would then realize how important it is to move in this direction. Uh, and we're hoping that that will still happen. We know we're into it for the long term. We know it's the right thing to do, and we will be persistent. Take it in a slightly different direction as we come kind of to the close here, too. And that is, over the course of your tenure in policing, and probably those of your colleagues with the coalition as well, one of the big changes has been the rapidity and instantaneousness of communication, particularly around video and social media and things like that. And for some reason that seems to portray police as often in bad light as it does in good light. How is that having an impact on some of the standards that you're thinking about? Well, first of all, I think it's a good indication of why uh, things need to change. Uh, you know, any of these things, if it wasn't for high phones and social media, high phone uh, recordings and social media would need to be brought to light. Um, you know, from our perspective, the so social media is actually helping us get our message out and talking about the deficiencies and helping us get our message out. The use of body worn cameras for police officers to me is very important. Uh, you know, it, it shows you exactly what happened at the scene of a crime uh, or at the scene of an event or conflict or whatever it is. It's, I think they're invaluable. Expensive, but they're invaluable. Uh, so, uh, you know, to me, that's another reason why having national training standards is the communication is changing so fast in our world that our police officers are not keeping up. Many small departments and police departments are struggling uh, just to be able to understand how you can use social media for your advantage social media for investigation. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, there's so many things that we're not learning that we could be learning and benefit from and improve the quality of service delivery to the people of Canada. Uh, so I think, I actually think that uh, well, it's helping us in our work. It's having a significant effect on policing and there's a way to manage it properly given uh, the right approach. Uh, so I don't know if I've answered your question, Ian, but that's my, my approach. Like I am very open. I believe in the media, whether it's social media or the regular media in Canada plays an important role in democracy, holding government accountable, holding the police accountable, and holding lawyers and doctors accountable. Uh, I think it plays a very, very important role in Thank you. I want, I want to talk about the future because you talk about you needing to meet with the Minister of Public Safety. I'm assuming yes. that's not just federal, but you need to meet with his counterpart, Minister LeBlanc's counterparts in each province as well to get them to sign off. What What's happening behind the scenes right now that uh, Canadians can sort of breathe a sigh of relief that the reforms are coming and this organization, the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform, is at the front lines and actually spearheading this uh, reform? Well, first of all, we're pleased with the public safety minister. The public safety minister brings a new perspective to the public safety of Canada. Uh, the public safety minister has the Mass Casualty Commission on his desk. He's appointed he and the um, Attorney General in Nova Scotia have appointed a uh, a judge to ensure with a committee to ensure that these recommendations are implemented. They talk about uh, the need for a college for the RCMP. Uh, they talk, talk about changing the entire recruit training uh, in, in Regina, even moving from that facility because it has a very negative uh, in, impact from Indigenous people. Um, uh, we have a very strong board of directors uh, who uh, have some uh, contact with government, uh, and we're hoping behind the scenes that the door will open soon for the coalition to meet with the public safety minister. We would like to talk about how we can help the public safety minister move forward with some of his difficult thing, difficult issues that he has to deal with, and how our contribution can help improve public safety. So we're waiting um, to, for the door to open. 
Uh, it's like anything else dealing with the, with the government, it takes time. Now, again, I want to make it clear that our vision is that the college would be created, the college would create the national standards like they do with Dr. Free. And then the provinces would recognize the benefit and through a shared agreement would begin to join. They want to apply these standards under their own local peace acts or provisions and improve the training in our country. And they would be, want to be a part of this because it's for their benefit, uh, both financially and not having to reinvent the wheel every time there's something new in place. Uh, every time there's something new, Toronto, Calgary, and Edmonton do something different to try and deal with that issue. And they do it in their own way and best practices are never shared. I mean, imagine a college like in medicine that would share all best practices in training and education and operational practices for peace officers. Calgary wouldn't have to struggle with it, neither would Edmonton. They realize the college has completed the research after what happened in Toronto and Ottawa in this particular event and develop a package around that. I mean, you have a central repository of best practices and knowledge for everyone to draw from, which is without doubt in the best interest of the attorney generals uh, in each of the provinces of Australia. David, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's always a pleasure to sit down with people who are instrumental in making our societies better. So thank you so much for the work you do, but also for the work that the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform does as well. So thank you. Thanks. Chris and Ian, thank you for having me. I truly appreciate it.